All right. Hello, class, and welcome to Lecture 5. Honestly, Lecture 5 uh, could very well have been Part C of Lecture 4, because they both deal with the same topic. The only difference is now we're considering hyperbolic orbits as opposed to elliptic orbits. However, um, however, uh, there are several important differences, and so we're putting it in a separate lecture to highlight those differences so that the some of these equations don't get conflated and you don't accidentally use a hyperbolic equation for an elliptic equation. Um, so if you may remember, <clears throat> uh, the goal in the lecture four was to be able to propagate the orbit forward in time to make predictions about where it's going to be at some future point in time. Uh, also recall now we're only dealing with 2D orbits, right? Before we had a, an elliptic orbit in the orbital plane, and now we've got, here's our central body, and now we've got a hyperbolic orbit also in the 2D plane. In the following lecture, lecture six, we'll start moving to three dimensions, but uh, that's not yet. So we're all in two dimensions. So there's only two orbital elements here. They're the same ones, A and E. And uh, the goal here is, right, the, those are the invariance of motion. And the goal here is then to predict where we're going to be at some future time. So basically we've got the same progression here, uh, T on one end and R and V on the other. My apologies if my R looks a lot like my V. Uh, T, right, for elliptic orbits, remember, we went through mean motion and got to, uh, well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, <clears throat> eccentric anomaly, and then to true anomaly, and then from true anomaly through the polar equation to R and V, right? And these steps were reversible uh, with the one caveat that this particular reversible step is through the Kepler equation, uh, which requires iteration, right? So now we're going to repeat these steps for hyperbolic orbits. Uh, I have orbits in parentheses because, of course, hyperbolic orbits are not orbits. They don't orbit. Uh, they don't repeat. So hyperbolic orbits are one-time things. I better would be better served using the word hyperbolic trajectories. But trajectories, trajectories, four syllables, orbits, sort of one syllable. So we say, or I say orbits, uh, although I really shouldn't. Uh, that's why it's in quotation marks. Um, so that's sort of, a, in a nutshell, sort of summarizes this whole lecture, which is uh, not honestly one of my best. Uh, it uh, doesn't get into any of the derivations of any of the equations that we get into, really. It's uh, it's more of just a re repeat of the elliptic orbits without any uh, useful insight into the, uh, into the geometry or the derivations of any of these equations. Right, well, with that uh, sort of uh, inauspicious uh, introduction, I suppose I should get started. Um, yeah, with this, uh, this, uh, this lecture, which really should be part of lecture four. Well, you know how it is. Uh, this is what we have, and so it's the cards that were dealt. Uh, reminded of the old Gandalf quote when you're going through the mines of Morium. There are older and fouler things than orcs in the deep places of the web. Let us hope that our presence may go unnoticed. Of course, for Gandalf, it didn't go unnoticed. That was the last we heard of Gandalf the Grey. Uh, he emerged significantly later in the book uh, as Gandalf the White probably needed a change of clothes after debbing, delving into the deep places of the web. In any case, uh, there's a couple of things that we've got to, uh, we've got to cover in this, in this lecture, right? Uh, specifically, uh, eccentric anomaly is no longer going to cut it. So we got to introduce hyperbolic anomaly, uh, one of the big contributions of Lambert. We're going to do Kepler's equation again. Uh, again, it's not... I say again, but it's actually different Kepler's equation, uh, neither of which, of course, were really proposed by Kepler, but what the heck. Uh, and then, of course, we'll use that to R, find R and V, and we'll do a sort of interesting uh, Jupiter flyby example there at the end. All right. 
So if there's a highlight to this lecture, it's probably me repeating a uh, table from Velado's book. Uh, Velado, by the way, a big fan of Velado. If you're a practicing engineer, Velado's book is like uh, the Bible, really. It has everything you probably ever want to know, including, well, it's, it's not really focused on interplanetary. In fact, there's almost no interplanetary stuff in there at all. Uh, but uh, it, it's mostly Earth-centric, so that does one drawback. But uh, Velado is very methodical, so I, I just love uh, Velado's textbook. Uh, he actually introduces all the algorithms for solving all of the, the problems, and uh, has a, you can download the algorithms uh, just in MATLAB, and it's very convenient. In any case, I have this plot here because uh, just to highlight the things which... Uh, are the same for elliptic orbits and hyperbolic trajectories, orbits, uh, and things which are not. And I'm going to get keep getting stuck on the word hyperbolic orbit slash trajectories um, until I sort of figure out which I prefer. Uh, I know which I prefer. I prefer orbits, but it's, it's wrong. So I'm, that's why I'm stuck. Uh, in any case, <laughs> having gone through that, let's, uh, let's go through these, uh, these, these things which are the same and the things which are different. Right. So a uh, couple uh, important uh, things which are the same, the peri periaps, uh, the distance of periaps, uh, he uses Q, right? We use RP. Uh, that's the same for hyperbolic and elliptic orbits, so positive there. Uh, the vis-viva equation, uh, so here velocity equation, uh, is the same for elliptic and hyperbolic orbits. Uh, the relationship between energy and semi-major axis, the same for hyperbolic and elliptic orbits. Um, things which are not the same, mean motion is not the same uh, for hyperbolic and elliptic mode orbits because we don't have that repetition. There's no fraction of the period. They look very similar, but they're actually not because, of course, there's a negative sign here. Right. Uh, we'll come back to that later. Of course, uh, these things don't repeat, um, so there's no period of a hyperbolic orbit, p equals infinity. Uh, the conversion between a centric anomaly and a true anomaly, of course, not the same because there's no such thing as a centric anomaly for hyperbolic orbits, so I guess we'll just go ahead and highlight that as a difference. Uh, the uh, mean anomaly, the Kepler's equation, of course, uh, there's no such thing as a centric anomaly again, so that has to be different as well. Uh, the, uh, let's see, what else we got here? There's a, um, uh, a, the um, polar equation is the same, although here it's not. Uh, he, he actually lists the alternative version of the polar equation. Uh, defined directly in terms of hyperbolic and eccentric anomaly. I typically don't use that equation. I use the one that works for both, which is r equals p over 1 plus e cosine f, right? And that is the same, so uh, I guess this is like half the same and half different. Um, so depending on if you use uh, this version or my version, so I guess I'll, I should really color it both colors. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the uh, rate of sweep of area, a.k.a. Kepler's second law. Of course, that's the same uh, for hyperbolic and elliptic orbits. So we'll just color that. Uh, you could also express this, of course, uh, as equal to h over 2, right? h over 2, uh, where that's the angular momentum. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, differences, of course, the, well, the conic section equation, okay, let's say that's different, right? The conic section equation uh, for hyperbola and a uh, ellipse uh, is, is, has that negative sign in there. Um, the, I don't know, the equation for eccentricity, I guess that's, uh, I, don't, I don't typically use that equation, so I'm not going to highlight it. Uh, of course, a difference here, I guess you could say that the uh, semi-major axis is negative for uh, hyperbolic orbits and positive for uh, elliptic orbits, so I'll highlight that. Um, other than that, uh, I don't use any of these other equations, so I don't need to worry about them. Right. 
So, uh, okay, so most of the, I guess, uh, key equations that we aren't using in time are the same for hyperbolic and elliptic orbits. But of course, the ones that are involved in our little trans our transformation to ta from time to R and V, uh, specifically this one, this one, and uh, this one are different. And so we're going to have to deal with that. Right, so let's, uh, let's go through the uh, process for, for elliptic orbits uh, from getting from T to R and V uh, and see what we need to modify for the case of hyperbolic orbits. So T goes to mean anomaly right here through this equation to eccentric anomaly in this equation to true anomaly in this equation to R and V in this equation. So let's, uh, let's go through these four steps. Right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and see which of those four steps can be unaltered, which we don't need to, to change for the case of hyperbolic orbits. It turns out, well, as I might have indicated, the only step which doesn't, which remains unaltered, unnoticed, I suppose, uh, in this four-step process is step four. And that's uh, because that's the, that only involves the polar equation, which is up here, although Volato lists that as separate, and the uh, vis viva equation, right, which is listed here. Right, uh, true anomaly is still right, the parameter we use to describe the motion of the orbit or the parameterize the orbit, because uh, the polar equation were, is, is equally valid for hyperbolic orbits, so we don't need to, to modify our definition of a true anomaly. The eccentricity vector still points towards the periaps, so we don't have to modify that, modify our definition of true anomaly or anything else. Right? So eccentricity vector unchanged. Uh, yeah, eccentricity vector, unchanged, still measures, um, in this case, uh, how we're, in this plot, measures rotation counterclockwise. Uh, so, conclusion, step four, unchanged. No modifications required for step four. Sadly, however, that is the only step that doesn't require a modification. The other three steps, uh, going from uh, T to mean anomaly, going from mean anomaly to eccentric anomaly, and going from eccentric anomaly to true anomaly, uh, all require modification because, of course, eccentric anomaly is defined using this weird auxiliary circle uh, here uh, on this inscribed uh, circle, uh, I guess superscribed uh, reference circle. Right? And obviously we can't write, inscribe a uh, reference circle around the hyperbolic orbit because it goes off to infinity and it would have infinite radius. So that's not gonna work. Uh, likewise, mean anomaly also has problems because it's defined as the fraction, it's uh, how it's defined is the fraction of the um, orbit in radians that we're, we pass through. Uh, so fraction of the period that we pass through in radians. And of course, period has no meaning for hyperbolic orbits. Again, right, coming back to the problem that it thought an orbit, so it has no period, no period. Uh, so in that, for that reason, we have this issue, mean anomaly, eccentric anomaly, eccentric anomaly. All three of the, all two of those uh, parameters appear in these three steps, and hence we have to redefine these three steps. Now, this is a pain and results in uh, extra lectures, which, while not too long, uh, are, uh, are a bit burdensome. And so some people, uh, so in particular Prussing and Conway, use the universal variables approach to deal with a single set of equations which define both the elliptic and hyperbolic case. I don't because I like talking about uh, eccentric anomaly and hyperbolic anomaly because they're interesting and they're historical and they have like a nice geometric meaning which uh, is easily in, is, 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 is kind of easy to interpret. Hyperbolic uh, anomaly, however, requires hyperbolic trigonometry, which um, 
well, I'm not an expert in, and I won't pretend to be, so uh, as I said, the derivations in this uh, lecture are uh, practically non-existent. On plus side, it means we can get through the lecture quicker. Right. As I said, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, period for a hyperbolic orbit is not defined, therefore there's no reference circle, therefore there's no eccentric uh, anomaly. Uh, and furthermore, we're not using the universal variable approach of Prussing and Conway uh, for the reasons I just described. So we're going to have to revisit these steps in their entirety. Um, occasionally, you know, there's good arguments for using the universal variable approach, one of the which is it involves uh, case logic, uh, I mean, the hyperbolic versus a Elliptic orbits require case logic. And if you're searching over these orbits, and trust me, I've done lots of searching over orbits, uh, it gets to be a bit of a pain um, in terms of uh, calculating periods and so forth and so forth. If you see my space elevator paper, we have to deal with that quite a bit, especially with Lambert's problem, switching those, uh, those cases. Uh, however, uh, this is not a uh, paper, or this is not a lecture on Lambert's problem, and so I don't think we need to... Uh, we don't, we don't need to, we're not required to use the universal variables approach. Uh, also, I don't like it. So what are we going to do then? How are we going to redefine these steps? Uh, so remember, we got T to M, M to E, and E to F, right? So let's start, uh, and then of course we have step four, getting to R and V. And let's, uh, let's focus on step three first. Step three, uh, which is somehow relating uh, the true anomaly to something which is slightly easier to measure, which is the, uh, in this case, it was the eccentric anomaly, and in this case will be the hyperbolic anomaly. Right? So again, right, remember that that clock uh, that we used in the elliptic case is still works, still works, right? So the rate of sweep of area, remember that first slide, uh, is still a constant h over two, right? So we can still use area, swept area, as a clock. Uh, so a equals h over two uh, delta t. So it makes sense that we would want something, uh, some kind of represent easier to measure representation uh, in terms of area. So, Hence, we get the hyperbolic anomaly. Right. So, of course, what we're looking for, and now actually I'm like uh, looking, need a smaller pen here. Uh, we can measure, right, this rate of uh, the swept area as a function of time. So there's the swept area. This is a periaps right here. This, uh, again, is an image from uh, Velado's book. So, uh, again, I like this image and I like Velado's book. Um, so uh, we can measure this as a function of time. And so the, the, the goal, right, is then to relate this swept area to uh, V, uh, which actually in our case is F, which is uh, we, which was what we, were, or we would like to find. So specifically, we would like to find, in this case, um, F as a function of area. That's not going to be possible. Uh, however, we can, we'll be able to find F, uh, well actually we'll be able to find uh, actually H as a function of F and then uh, that will give us uh, the hyperbolic version of Kepler's equation. <clears throat> so as with the case of elliptic orbits, uh, this is a problem of finding lots of areas and uh, trying to determine them as a function of angles. So unfortunately, unlike in the elliptic case, uh, there's no reference ellipse. Uh, and so there's also no reference hyperbola, which we can get the same kind of uh, logic for, right, as we got for the eccentric anomaly. Um, instead, we, and this is partially because hyperbola um, don't obey the same trigonometric representations as triangles do. 
Uh, so specifically, you've got a hyperbola there, right? Okay, that's an awful, okay, that's not a good hyperbola. There's a hyperbola, right? So if you measure these three angles, one, two, three, they don't add up to 180 degrees. That's a problem. Uh, and specifically, they add up less to than 180 degrees. The analysis of the angles of the hyperbola, in fact, all of uh, trigonometric, uh, tri uh, hyperbolic trigonometry, uh, was uh, this, this, this relationship between the angles uh, and the areas was, uh, was investigated by Lambert um, about, uh, when did Lambert, uh, in about uh, 30 or 40 years after Newton. Um, <clears throat> so it was only af at, at the time of Lambert that all these uh, relationships for the hyperbolic orbit were, were resolved. Uh, the, uh, so the, the areas are much more difficult to compute if you don't have hyperbolic trigonometry. And so hyperbolic trigonometry was invented for the sole purpose of computing these, uh, these areas. Okay. So hyperbolic trigonometry is weird. Um, and so I have a, a, a brief slide on, on, on the next slide. Uh, so basically speaking, uh, our, our, re our hyperbolic anomaly is this weird mix of area slash angle. It's, so there's, there's this conflation of area and angle in hyperbolic functions, uh, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, we define a reference hyperbola for which we can apply excellent hyperbolic trigonometry to. Uh, and that reference hyperbola is defined by, um, remember for, uh, for the, uh, the inscribing ellipse, or the, the, the reference circle on the elliptic case, it was x squared plus y squared equals a squared. So the reference hyperbola is actually almost identical except for that switched sign here. Right. Where we've uh, in Cartesian coordinates, we've uh, swapped the sign plus to minus here, right? So that's a difference. Highlight that. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, however, it gives a significantly different shape, right? <laughs> so it gives this uh, this uh, reference hyperbola here, and in particular, the reference hyperbola that we're defining is the one where this point occurs at periapse. So here's our trajectory. It's going off this direction. And the inner point of this reference hyperbola occurs at that periapse. Right. And uh, the, uh, the center of that hyperbola, so hyperbolas have a center, uh, occurs over here. Now, where is that? That's someplace. Uh, actually, you can measure where it is uh, from this relationship AE. Uh, so AE is the distance from the, fo from the focus to the center of this reference hyperbola. So it's, uh, it's amplified by this length A. Um, compare, of course, to the ellipse, where we have the center uh, to the center of the ellipse to the focus, uh, which is AE in the elliptical case. Uh, and then we have the inscribing circle there as well. So unfortunately, of course, right, the, the center, uh, in, the, in the elliptical case, the center of the ellipse in the center of the inscribing circle at the same point. The center of the reference hyperbola, however, and the center of the actual hyperbola are not at the same point. This is the center of the actual hyperbola. Right. So, right, life is more complicated. So, a uh, basic uh, rehash of your, uh, your hyperbolic trigonometry which you may have learned in, uh, in high school or perhaps not. I don't know if it's still taught very, very commonly uh, because honestly, uh, you don't see it very much. But this is one place you saw it. So if you learned it, this is the place to use it. Uh, so if you didn't learn it, however, I'll just have a brief rehash. Uh, so the hyperbolic, uh, so if you remember our trigonometry, right, uh, gives a relationship between uh, this angle theta, and this is uh, the uh, hypotenuse, let's call it um, hy h for hypotenuse, and then the opposite sign is h sine theta and h cos, uh, cosine theta, 
right? So it gives the, the length of the sides of the uh, right triangle. Now, for a uh, right hyperbola, uh, we don't, angles don't mean as much in the hyperbola case, right? Because we don't have this one plus equals, sum equals 180 thing going for us. Uh, so in the, in the case of the reference hyperbola, we relate the sides of the reference hyperbola to the area of the hyperbola. So that's kind of weird. So instead of, hy uh, instead of this angle, uh, we're talking about the area of the hyperbola, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's a scaled area of the hyperbola. So we're, we're assuming that uh, there's a unit one here. Uh, if it's not a unit one, say if like these uh, lengths are say uh, h, Si, cinch uh, A and H, well, I really, I should use E here, or H, I should use big H because that's our hyperbolic anomaly. So I'm just gonna plot out all those H's. Uh, so, and then actually, now I have too many H's, so I add A's there. So if, we, uh, if we're looking at now uh, the equivalent to H sine theta and H cosh theta, uh, then, right, we've got a squared going into the area, right? Because, right, when you multiply the length and the width by a, both by a, then the area square is, uh, scales as, as a squared, right? So this uh, weird uh, hyperbolic trigonometry gives us a relationship between area, which is, you know, very useful because we have this equal areas in equal times and we like to deal with area, um, to the lengths of these sides, right? And hopefully, uh, through some uh, fancy uh, uh, hyperbolic trigonometry, uh, we'll be able to relate that back to the area swept out and hence to time, and possibly even to true anomaly. Yeah. So, uh, okay, with that said, right, again, hyperbolic trigonometry was invented by Lambert. We'll see Lambert again, very, uh, by the way, when we consider Lambert's problem. Another important problem that Lambert solved, Lambert was very productive. Um, I should also say that uh, Riccati actually uh, was said to have independently, uh, well, he is not said to, he published a work on it, but he, uh, he independently uh, came up with the uh, hyperbolic trigonometry about the same time. Riccati uh, family is very productive as well. Uh, perhaps that family is well, more, more well known for Riccati's father, uh, Giuseppe Riccati, who invented the Riccati equation which if you're in controls, you see quite a bit, or you used to see quite a bit when people were still solving Riccati equations. So uh, I think I miss here. Uh, if you want uh, you know, to actually know something about all the complex relationships uh, between for hyperbolic trig, uh, you can go to the wiki page. There's lots of them. I can't remember even a tenth of those relationships and uh, hence, why we don't have actually the derivation of the results that I present in this in this lecture. Um, so having said that, right, uh, you just have to imagine that I went through all these derivations in great detail, uh, and then you skip them as you did in uh, lecture uh, lecture four, and got went straight to this slide. I'm sure you didn't skip them, right? Uh, that that would be terrible. You should not have done that. Uh, but if you did, uh, you're just going to pretend you did the, the same thing here and that I explained them in, in great detail and ad, ad nauseum. Right, so uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. Here's your reference hyperbola. Remember that reference hyperbola here? There's that same a squared h, and there's the length of the sides, a cinch and a cosh here. No, where's a cosh? There's a cosh. And there we go. And we, uh, we're gonna express uh, a single length in terms of both of those, uh, those numbers. Uh, which length, I forget, because I didn't do the derivation. But we express a set, one of those lengths in terms of both of those, uh, those, those numbers, both f and h. And uh, we then use them to obtain these relationships between the hyperbolic anomaly h and the true anomaly f. This was the easy part. It was the easy part for elliptic orbits. And again, it's the easy part for hyperbolic anom uh, uh, anomaly or hyperbolic orbits, trajectories, something like that. Ah, blows my mind. Uh, in any case, you, at least I assume it is because I didn't go through the derivation. Apologies. 
But in any case, right, uh, so this gives us uh, one part of the step, right? Uh, so the last part, remember, was going from F to R of V. That was step four. Uh, this gives us the relationship between H and F so that uh, it goes both directions. Uh, that's step three. So here it is, step three. Uh, in this, so if you have F and you want H, right, if you're going that direction, you use uh, this equation. And there are such things as inverse tanj, so your calculator probably has it. And if you're going this direction, uh, you're given h and you want to find f, you use this equation right there. So again, ah, there's an, a typo. Oh no. Just pretend there's not a typo. I'm just going to do, do. That was there all the whole time. You didn't see that. Uh, so if you compare the to, to the formula for eccentric anomaly, um, almost identical. Look at that. Right. Almost identical. Tanch, tanch, tan. Oh, look, another. Oh, no, that's not. That wasn't a typo because F is not a hyperbolic. Oh, what am I doing? Clearly, I didn't go over my slides clearly enough, well enough. Um, so, right, if you look at the comparison to hyperbolic anomalies, almost identical. Uh, the only difference is... Uh, that now uh, on the square root, instead of 1 minus e, it couldn't possibly be 1 minus e for the hyperbolic case because in hyperbolic case, e is greater than 0. Uh, hyperbola, lay. Right? So uh, we just uh, assume that the, uh, it can't be, zero, can't be 1 minus e, and so we take the obvious counterpart. It's, uh, let's see, uh, e minus one on the denominator. So that's the only difference. We've swapped these uh, these two terms or put a negative sign in front of it, and that's the only thing we've done. It's remarkable that it turns out to be exactly the same. I just, uh, the, uh, uh, considering the derivations are significantly different. Uh, well, I don't know if the, I mean, the approach to the derivations are, are similar, right? I mean, you're subtracting areas and so forth. Uh, but I, I, I'm shocked that, shocked that, uh, and surprised that uh, it gets out, get, comes out to be almost identical. Yeah. So, um, right, that's uh, step three. Uh, what about uh, step two? Well, we're not there yet, but we will be shortly. Um, a, as for in the case of uh, elliptic orbits, we can actually skip uh, step three if we want. Uh, go straight to R and V from hyperbolic anomaly. So remember, there's hyperbolic anomaly now, true anomaly, and R and V. And uh, there is a version of the polar equation which skips true anomaly entirely and goes straight from H to R and V. And likewise, you can invert it and go straight from R and V to H, if you like. I like true anomaly because I know what it is. I don't really know what hyperbolic anomaly is, so I like to have that nice true anomaly there so I know, right, I know what that angle is. It gives me a lot of, like, physical intuition as to where this item is in its orbit. So I don't like doing this. You can do it if you like. Velado likes it. Uh, he didn't even include the Kepler, the polar equation in his table, uh, but I don't. So then what are you going to do? Right, so the other two uh, steps, one and two, um, Again, remarkably similar. They end up being remarkably similar to the elliptic case, uh, except that they have minor differences, which are actually major differences. So remember, we're going from T to M to H to uh, F. Right. So we're now on here step one and step two. So. Of course, we have now uh, F in terms of H and H in terms of F. And so if we actually want to find F as a function of T, right, uh, we're going to lo be looking for F as a function of H of T. And of course, uh, from that F as a function of H as a function of uh, mean anomaly as a function of T, right? So mean anomaly, what does that mean here? Well, it doesn't mean much. 
Uh, it's just a, it's just a temporal timekeeping. Remember, mean anomaly doesn't didn't mean much in the elliptic case either, right? It was just a, a bookkeeping tool so that our time would scale better, right? So there are angles uh, wouldn't uh, you, this relationship between angle uh, when we wrote down the Kepler equation, right? We wrote down Kepler equation on the the right hand side here. This is the hyperbolic Kepler equation, and on the left we had. Uh, this factor n times t, so we're, you know, factor of area. Um, but that was like, the units were on that way. Remember, the units on time are large, right? They, uh, well, I mean, the units are small, they're seconds. But the value of t is very large, and so we didn't really like that. So we introduced this auxiliary uh, thing, which we called mean anomaly, which is essentially the percentage of the orbit which you've gone through. Uh, notice that we never actually use area here. We, we divide area by the hyperbo the In the elliptic case, we divided it by the, uh, the area of the ellipse. And in the hyperbolic case, I assume we divide it by the area of the hyperbola. Um, but uh, in any case, we never actually use uh, Kepler's second law to get the integrated area. That's not a step in our, in our progression. Uh, in any case, uh, so... We're going to go do step one real quick uh, using a new conversion from time to radians. Uh, it's awfully similar to our old version of um, uh, uh, conversion of time to radians, uh, but it lacks, in this case, almost any physical meaning, right? Because there's no period. It's not a fraction of the period, right? So uh, the only difference, right, for elliptic orbits, it was mu over a cubed. Of course, you can't use that scaling for hyperbolic uh, orbits because a is less than zero. And so the uh, modification that we do is just to add a negative sign in front of that a. Okay. So mean anomaly, I should write it in n sub h if I like, just to distinguish it from uh, mean motion in the elliptic case, hyperbolic mean motion versus the elliptic mean motion, um, n sub h. And, uh, and then the, all, the sole purpose of this mean motion is to give us an angle, uh, which we then call mean anomaly, although again, it's like missing that mean interpretation, right? Uh, the, that It's not really an average of anything. Uh, but uh, we still call it mean anomaly because we don't like changing our equations much. Um, but really, we should call it something else, m sub h. In any case, it's a, a, an angle which represents time. Um, so it's, uh, it scales radians per second here, this mean motion. And so it converts uh, time, which you measured in seconds, to radians, something uh, which is uh, more amenable for uh, solving the hyperbolic version of Kepler's equation. And speaking of the hyperbolic version of Kepler's equation, this is where the real juice of the derivation, which I didn't include, comes from, uh, which relates uh, this mean anomaly. Uh, actually, it goes through area. The derivation does not mean anomaly. But we convert it to mean anomaly, nonetheless. Uh, so the, relating that area to the hyperbolic anomaly uh, we get a version of Kepler's equation which works for hyperbole. Now again, uh, the hyperbolic anomaly here is, uh, again, dicey, right? Uh, and we don't have to worry about this degrees because hopefully you're not using hyperbolic uh, angles in terms of radians or uh, degrees, but it's just the, uh, that hyperbolic, it, it, sort of a fractional area, uh, if you like. Uh, so units on that, actually I should say um, you, hyperbolic units. Actually, I'm not sure what the hyperbolic unit is. I should double check that. Uh, in any case, uh, it's, uh, this is Kepler's equation for hyperbolic orbits. Again, not derived by Kepler, uh, but of course the original one wasn't either. Uh, so again, right, if we want to convert this direction from hyperbolic anomaly to mean anomaly, that's easy. If we want to convert the other direction, however, that's a little bit harder. Uh, 
because of course this is worse than uh, even even worse to solve than the uh, the Kepler's equation uh, because it's got that cinch in there and so we need to uh, use uh, Newton iteration again if we want M and we want to find H to invert this equation we need to use a numerical algorithm uh, specifically Newton iteration now remember what Newton iteration is right what, what, what are we solving we're solving this uh, the equation this uh, minus m equals zero right that's our f of h and uh, Newton iteration is uh, h k plus one equals h k plus uh, well this term is f of h k and this term is f prime of h k actually incidentally enough the derivative of a hyperbolic and cinches and cautious uh, is actually a little bit easier than sines and cosines because they don't flip sines when you, you, when you differentiate them. Uh, so, uh, so the derivative of sine is, 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 si is cosine. And the derivative of cosine is also sine. So there's no, no sine switch in there. Anyway, obviously, uh, you take the derivative of this and it's uh, uh, just cosh minus one. And uh, this looks uh, also suspiciously similar to the elliptic case. Right? So there's the Newton iteration uh, for obtaining H from M. Again, uh, if you use your uh, mean anomaly as initial guess, it uh, usually works pretty well. Uh, we can see that uh, from the plots here I've got here. Um, so here's the one for elliptic cases. Here's the hyperbolic cases. Again, uh, actually, this is mean anomaly versus true anomaly. Really, I should, uh, should, have, ha should have the plot of mean anomaly versus uh, hyperbolic anomaly, but I don't have it here. Uh, and you can see that, uh, well, what's going on here? This is, these are both versus true anomaly. Uh, in the zero eccentricity case, circular orbits, uh, it's a straight line. As you get closer and closer to an ellipse, or to, to a straight, to a, as you get more and more eccentric, uh, if this flattens out, so you get to something that's very low derivative right here. Uh, and then that pops out again on the, uh, so this is say E equals one is a straight line here. Uh, and then as you get um, more eccentric, uh, then right, this curve straightens out until you get to something like a line here coming back in there. Um, just a, you know, a quick uh, note. Uh, so if you've got a, a hyperbolic, a not, a hyperbolic orbit, right? Here's your central body. Uh, I can imagine two orbits, right? One where the, uh, the, uh, the orbit has changed very little and one where it's changed a great deal, right? So which of these has the higher eccentricity, right? So this one is the one that has the higher eccentricity. E is maybe 12 or something like this. And this is like E equals approximately 1.2. So when you get to E closer and closer to 1, you get closer and closer to the parabola, which means that basically your orbit is just turning around. right? Uh, and so it uh, basically comes here and from infinity and this does a U-turn and kind of goes around. Whereas the limiting case when E equals infinity is just a straight line and it completely ignores your planet. Say, for example, you're trying to calculate the hyperbolic flyby of Jupiter by uh, Pluto or something, right? That Jupiter isn't affected, right? It's, it's eccentricity with respect to that central body is infinity, right? And so those are the limiting cases here, right? Where we've got... Uh, we're flying by with uh, perpendicular, E equals infinity, and the do a 180 degree turn, E equals uh, one. Right. You know, again, right, uh, the reason for these shapes is uh, because this mean anomaly is, really doesn't have that same physical meaning uh, that we had in the case of ellipses. Uh, so it's hard, harder to interpret that way. Uh, so, but anyway, that's the case. Did I miss anything over here? Uh, these are just the comparisons to the equations for ellipses, right? So we changed this one to be a negative sign for hyperbole, and uh, we swapped this one, put a cinch there, 
move the sign, swap the sign uh, for hyperbolic anomalies. Make that H. It's H. Well, um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about hyperbolic anomalies, right? Uh, hi or hyperbole in general on the time front, right? We've now got a method of going from T to this mean hyperbolic anomaly, really, to uh, the actual hyperbolic anomaly, to the true anomaly, and hence uh, the through the polar equation to R and V. Uh, and you can reverse these steps, of course, uh, with the caveat that on this reversal you need the Kepler's equation. Well, actually, no, it's, this, is, this is the direction you need the Kepler equation for. Or, yeah, sorry, you need new, new duration for. This is the easy direction. Right. So uh, we're going to do a, a, a little a demo here of uh, how to apply these equations. Uh, real brief, uh, just, well, not, not too brief, actually. Um, uh, I say brief because we're going to do the easy direction and not go through new iteration again because, right, that takes up an extra slide just by itself. Uh, so actually, we're going to be looking at the problem of going uh, this direction, R to T. So there's a nice, uh, nice application of this, which is uh, flybys of Jupiter, right? So uh, let's see. This is Cassini. It does a fly Jupiter swing by. Lo lots of, lots of, uh, lots of spacecraft and interplanetary missions go by Jupiter uh, for no other reason than to get a gravity assist, right? Jupiter gives a massive gravity assist if you use it right, uh, and allows you to get almost uh, most of the interplanetary spacecraft. I believe that went out of the solar system. They were already uh, inter inter what do you call it? Uh, intersol intersolar uh, extrasolar system, right? They were already at escape velocity after their swing by of Jupiter, right? So Jupiter flybys uh, are probably the most productive flybys that uh, these spacecraft all experience. So flying by Jupiter is a, is a very common thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, it's dangerous. Jupiter, uh, it wasn't known actually until uh, Pioneer 10 how, uh, how dangerous Jupiter was um, in terms of radiation. So Jupiter uh, has massive radiation belts. Uh, so the, it has a, I don't know why, uh, maybe no one knows why. I mean, it is, uh, there's a lot of liquid metal there, or liquid hydrogen. Uh, it circles, there's a lot of storms. Uh, but in any case, it produces a great deal of magnetosphere, a uh, huge magnetosphere, uh, extending millions of miles into space. Uh, and that, like the Van Allen belts on Earth, that magnetosphere traps a whole lot of radiation, right? So uh, the solar wind goes by, forms a bow shack, but radiation which gets inside gets trapped, it gets, uh, oscillates around those magnetic field lines. And so there's a huge amount of radiation uh, on Jupiter, in the, in the orbit of Jupiter. So in particular, right, uh, I believe the, uh, the number is like, in the millions, millions of times more radioactive, uh, these inner belts of Jupiter uh, than the Van Allen belts. Okay? So for example, uh, Pioneer 10, right, when it passed by Jupiter. Uh, Pioneer 10, how close did it come? Uh, so the radius of Jupiter is uh, 70, 71,000 kilometers. All right. I believe Pioneer 10 uh, passed within uh, 200,000 kilometers of Jupiter. So I think it's on the next slide. Uh, yeah, it's peri Pioneer's 10 periaps was at 200,000 kilometers radius, right? So 130,000 kilometers above Jupiter. Uh, in Pioneer 10, at 130,000 kilometers above Jupiter, uh, experienced uh, about, I think it was 250,000 rads. Pioneer 10. 250,000 thousand rats right uh, just for reference right uh, how many rads is needed to kill a, a human 500 rats right so 500 rads equals death so pioneer 10 experienced 250,000 rads uh, fortunately there weren't any humans on pioneer 10 
uh, but it was uh, it was far more uh, rads than they expected, and it was uh, it has actually it would have experienced more if it didn't actually uh, get actually a, do I have a picture of that somewhere? No, I think, unfortunately I don't have a picture. Uh, if it didn't actually get tucked in under the uh, one of those radiation belts, the radiation belts move around quite a bit. Uh, actually, do I, I think I have a picture of that. Uh, so if you, yeah, so you can see there's a, I love the little dance that like uh, the radiation belts are doing. It's like, do, 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 do. I'm a radiation belt. Anyway, sorry, that's like completely ridiculous. Uh, so anyway, they actually got, uh, fortunately the radiation belts were a little bit up and so it like managed to sneak underneath one. Uh, otherwise it, w it might've been completely fried. Uh, but uh, it, it lost some data. There were all sorts of like random ghost signal, ghost commands being sent to uh, to Pioneer 10. And it was just lucky it survived uh, to get out of the solar system. Fortunately, it did. I guess I just built uh, built things better back, back then. Um, more recent, uh, I mean, this is such a problem. Uh, these radiation belts uh, are such a problem that, uh, in fact, the, the recent Jupiter probe, Juno, uh, was uh, dispatched with his primary mission to to to, uh, to investigate this magnetosphere and, and estimate the how these radiation belts are, are are moving around. I think this is from uh, this is from Juno actually. Um, so uh, again, right, big deal. Um, the uh, incidentally, the uh, the Joan Juno probe. Um, well, Juno probe had some issues, but anyway, uh, it was injected into uh, Juno into Jupiter orbit, so it's a polar orbit. Um, polar orbits? Have I discussed polar orbits? I forget if I've even discussed polar orbits. Um, get get rid of the dancing Jupiter over there. Uh, polar orbit, uh, right? There's Jupiter. Polar orbit goes over the poles, right? That's a terrible drawing. Right. So polar orbit passes through the poles. Of Jupiter. Why does it pass through the poles? Because if you go back to my jiggling Jupiter, there's my jiggling Jupiter. It's still going. Yeah, there's my jiggling Jupiter. Notice that the uh, the radiation is concentrated on the side. So if you actually go uh, up and down in a polar orbit, you miss these huge radiation belts. So that's actually why uh, Juno's still alive. But even so, right, it experiences massive amounts of radiation, uh, partially because its periapse is so low. Uh, so the periapse of uh, Juno is actually only 4,200 kilometers above the surface of Jupiter. So uh, remarkably close. The periapse, however, uh, it's not intended this way, but the periapse is, is like way far out. In fact, Jup uh, Juno has been there like, I think is, uh, since it's now 2021, uh, January 2021. Uh, Juno has been there about four-ish years. And it's actually only completed about 31 orbits of Jupiter because its periapse is so far. It wasn't intended that way, uh, but there was uh, some issue with the helium on the, in the propulsion tanks, and uh, they decided it was better not to like lower the lower the apoapse. We'll talk about apoapse lowering uh, in a later lecture. In any case, uh, Incidentally, the uh, that that radiation extends uh, pretty far out, extends to the uh, to the to the moons. In fact, uh, Europa, Io, Ganymede, even Callisto lie in these outer radiation belts, and so uh, there's far more, far too much radiation on I on Euro Europa, Io, or Ganymede. Europa is the innermost one uh, to so, to to admit uh, human uh, surface exploration. So. If you're thinking of setting up a bread box on Ganymede to make food or whatever, like they did in uh, the uh, the Expanse, uh, you better have some pretty radiation-proof glass in the future because uh, otherwise you're getting fried. E Callisto, uh, it's dubious. You pretty you'd have to ra rad hard your your settlements pretty pretty well, but it's possible that NASA is still considering whether human exploration of Callisto is possible. Uh, because of the radiation limits, right? Anyway, so uh, long story short, Jupiter is hugely radioactive and you would do not want to spend great deals of time there. Uh, hence our little mission design problem here. 
Uh, so specifically, uh, we're going to do a Jupiter flyby, as most uh, interplanetary probes do. Uh, we have a Jupiter approach of uh, 10 kilometers per second. So that means before we get into the gravity well of Jupiter, uh, we're going uh, 10 kilometers per second, not 18, 10. And of course, after we fly by Jupiter, we'll also be going 10 kilometers per second with respect to Jupiter. The idea of a flyby, however, is that we gain absolute velocity. But anyway, uh, this is enough to give a, a sort of the energy of the of the flyby. Um, so, because of those radiation limits, uh, the mission planners don't want us to spend more than an hour uh, inside the uh, a radius of 100,000 kilometers of Jupiter. That's, uh, by the way, only uh, 31,000 kilometers above the surface. So our restriction is uh, we can't spend more than one hour under uh, 100,000 kilometers. So we have a radius at which we initially pass into this 100,000 kilometer exclusion zone. And we're going to do a flyby. And then we have another point in the orbit where we're passing out. So the goal then is to figure out uh, what is the time that elapses from this point, T1, to this point, T2. Right. So here we go. If we look at this progression here, uh, we have R, right, this point, and we have R at this point, two different points. And uh, we're going to go the easy direction. We're going to use uh, this progression to figure out what is the time uh, at which we pass in Jupiter's exclusion zone, and what point we pass out of Jupiter's exclusion zone. Uh, so uh, as I said, right, we have V, which is enough to give us the energy of the orbit, which is enough to give us the semi-major axis of the orbit, but not enough to give us the energy of the orbit. So I have to tell you what, how close we're coming. I could tell you how what the periapse radius was, is, and that you should be able to calculate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the eccentricity, but I don't. I'm like giving you a hand. I'll just tell you what the eccentricity is. It's 1.07. Okay. So the question is, uh, what are the time T1 and T2 at which we pass in and out of that exclusion zone? So it's not a terribly hard problem. Um, so specifically, let's just say uh, here's mu of Jupiter, 1.267 times 10 to the 8th. And uh, calcul first calculate our energy of the orbit. So the energy of the orbit is positive, right? Uh, because we're flying in from outside the gravity well, so it's positive energy. And that energy is all in the form of kinetic, right? So when we're outside the gravity well, there's no potential energy, right? That's the whole point, right? So we're at this point here, uh, T equals uh, 1 half V squared and V equals zero. No, connect, no potential energy. Uh, so we got the total energy of the orbit. Energy is preserved throughout this orbit. And so after we dip down, right, this uh, we get this exchange of potential and kinetic energy. Uh, but that doesn't matter for the purpose of our goal, which is calculating the semi-major axis. So we, uh, we know this energy. It's uh, have this equation here. And uh, we can just plug in for uh, V infinity, which was 10 if you remember from the previous slide. So this is equal to 50, uh, equal to 50. And we solve for, e, for A, which gives us a semi-major axis of negative uh, 1.267 times 10 to the sixth, if I didn't make any mistakes. Okay. Uh, and I don't think I did, All right? So yeah, OK. I'm just curious because those are the same numbers, but that's okay. That's because this turns out to be um, uh, 100, right? This is 100. So just divide by 100 and you get to drop two exponents. So easy problem. Uh, then calculate the parameter of the orbit, uh, if we like, 1.8359. And we're good to go. So now we can use the polar equation to, uh, with that parameter to get us the true anomaly at exit and entrance of the exclusion zone. There's Jupiter, there's the exclusion zone, there's our flyby, right? 
This is R uh, equals 100,000. And uh, so we just plug in 100,000 here into R. And P from the previous slide, it was like 1.86 times 10 to the 6 or something like that. 836, sorry, times 10 to the 6th. And uh, we invert this to solve for true anomaly by taking the inverse cosine. This is uh, 1.07, I think it was, or 5, something like that. 7, yep. And uh, this is, of course, that number right there. And we uh, take the inverse cosine, and we, we find two solutions, of course, because cosine has two solutions corresponding to the true anomaly at entrance and exit, right? So this one is uh, negative 65 degrees, and this one is positive 65 degrees. Right. So we now, in our progression, right, we've got uh, our V, we've gone to F, and now our progression is to go from F to hyperbolic anomaly, and hence to mean anomaly, and hence to T. So now we should take this number here, and convert it to hyperbolic anomaly. Using those formula we had on the previous slide, uh, inverse tanch of this number here. Uh, actually, it should be uh, two inverse tanch, I think, there. Uh, and so we get a hyperbolic anomaly of 0.1173. And now uh, we, uh, we've got H. Our next step is to find M. For this case, we use Kepler's equation. Right, and we plug in here 1. Uh, 0.1173, right there. And we find that the mean anomaly is 0. 0.0085. So a very small mean anomaly, but remember mean anomaly doesn't mean a whole lot uh, for, I mean, it's hard to interpret mean anomaly for hyperbolic orbits. Uh, so they, mm, because we were discontented with mean anomaly, let's very quickly move on to time uh, without talking about it too much. Um, in particular, we divide by the mean motion, again, not meaning very much, to get the time uh, for both uh, positive or mi and minus, by the way. Of course, like uh, there's a plus and minus here as well. Uh, for But either one, it doesn't matter. Uh, this would be negative if we had negative mean anomaly. Uh, so the positive one uh, is 1,000 seconds approximately, 1080 seconds. Uh, and so, uh, of course, that's the time at which we leave. Uh, the time at which we arrive in the exclusion zone is negative 1,076 seconds plus 1,076 seconds. And so the total time elapsed uh, in the exclusion zone is 2,153 seconds corresponding to 35 minutes. So that's less than one hour, and so the spacecraft survives. Yay! Right, so to summarize again this uh, rather mediocre and uninformative lecture, uh, we've got the equivalent of where we started for a hyperbolic anomaly. Uh, we're going from R and V, all right, T goes up here, so T, to mean anomaly or mean hyperbolic anomaly, to hyperbolic anomaly, to uh, true anomaly, which fortunately we're more familiar with, and then from R and V. And we can reverse these steps if we like. Uh, this is the one where we need Newton iteration required. So uh, with that, I'll conclude this lecture um, the, with a summary and uh, just perhaps the most useful part of the lecture, which is uh, putting out or repeating or cut and pasting Volato's uh, table of useful uh, uh, equations. The ones that we have changed again, I repeat, are the Kepler's equation here, uh, the uh, mean motion equation here, um, and, uh, let's see, well, the, anything else? Well, I guess the, the Cartesian one has changed there. Uh, other than that, they're uh, identical. This one technically has changed, but again, as I said, polar equation, if you, if, if you just use the true anomaly for the polar equation, it doesn't change. But okay, we'll say it changed anyway. Uh, oh, and of course, uh, the conversion formula changed. 
so and by the way this is f in our our analysis all right so uh with that i will conclude this lecture hopefully uh it at least uh, gave you some formula which you can use to predict your hyperbolic uh, transfers or predict where your hyperbolic uh, orbit is going to be at some point in the future. Um, and next time I will come back and we'll talk about more about prediction and, and uh, orbital elements, but now we'll be moving to three dimensions. So uh, when we come back in lecture six, we'll talk about the, the other uh, three orbital elements, uh, inclination, argument of periapse, and right ascension of ascending node. So with that, I will leave you for next time.